and uh, we move to the next talk, which is by uh, Vladimir. Yeah, we can see the screen. Um, so please go ahead when you're ready. All right. Uh, so today I will talk about uh, the universality driven analytic structure of QCD crossover. And this uh, talk is based on uh, these two works, uh, which I'll listed over here. Okay, so the main idea is uh, that we want to study uh, the QCD phase diagram, which was shown multiple times during this uh, session. And here I will uh, take another approach. I will use the uh, non-universal input from lattice QCD calculations, which were obtained uh, by doing really difficult uh, numerical simulations of QCD on the lattice. And I so complement them uh, with uh, a universality argument and an input on the universal property of uh, the underlying phase transition to get a new input on the QCD phase diagram. I mostly will be talking about the crossover. So whenever I'm talking about the phase transition, I have in mind uh, the transition relating to the uh, all four universality class only at some point, I will be mentioning a little bit uh, about the critical point, but most of my uh, discussion about the crossover only. Okay, so here's my very brief summary of what I'm going to tell you uh, just before uh, I lose you or if I run out of time. So we will consider a system very close to uh, the transition, okay? Then there will be a universal function uh, which depends on the one on one single variable, which I will call scaling variable. And this function describes the property of this transition. There is an universal mapping in principle between any theory uh, which belongs to the same universality class um, and this scaling variable and this mapping involves non-universal parameters. So, and what we map, we map temperature, chemical potential, let's say mass, the quark mass in QCD. So the analytical structure of this universal function defines essential thermodynamics of the system and it was known that this function uh, has poles. Uh, those, are, those poles are Youngly H singularities. Uh, the singularities essentially define the radius of convergence of uh, this function in term, uh, when you consider it the, uh, as an expansion in the scaling variable, or alternatively in QCD, you will consider an expansion, say, in the chemical potential. And those singularities, which would define the radius of convergence, are Youngly H singularities. And these are the central point of my discussion uh, today. Okay, the location of the young e singularities, although universal, actually was not known until recently. And in this talk, I will report uh, for the first time on their location. So QCD for small uh, pine mass, at least for small pine mass, uh, is described by this universal function. And thus, there are singularities at the complex uh, chemical potential plane, and their location can be uh, understood by taking the mapping uh, computed on the lattice QCD uh, for the non-universal parameters and the value of this uh, location of the Youngly H singularity, uh, which was found recently, okay? So this universal function and its location uh, can be computed in a simpler theory, which shares the same universality class as QCD. And this is why we do not uh, have to uh, solve the uh, QCD to actually uh, find the location of this singularity. Okay, so this was my summary, but let me uh, go back uh, and consider uh, the conventional approach. In the conventional approach, usually what we do, uh, we uh, imply latest QCD uh, calculations to, uh, which has only access to the zero chemical potential uh, to extract the Taylor series expansion uh, of the obtained uh, power series in the chemical potential um, uh, as a function of the chemical potential. So this Taylor series, uh, probably has a non-zero radius of convergence. Uh, and this non-zero radius of convergence can be in principle extracted uh, by analyzing this Taylor series. Okay. 
So radius of convergence uh, of a power series uh, in general in the complex analysis is defined by the closest singularity. So here is a very trivial example. If we consider this function, if it doesn't have anything uh, unusual on the real axis as a function of x, nevertheless, it has a singularity on the, on the purely imaginary plane when x equals to plus minus i. So if you would compute the radius of convergence of the Taylor series, you will uh, see that uh, the radius of convergence is defined by x equals uh, one. Uh, and this is exactly the location of the singularity. So this is a very trivial one. Now, there are other interesting uh, uh, examples of that, but uh, let me not go into the details uh, right now. So the singularities of the thermodynamic functions are actually interesting. Those might signal uh, the location of the critical point and phase transition. And this is why we always try to, like, uh, to, to learn things about the singularities of thermodynamic functions. So for example, uh, in the curl limit for O4 line, we expect um, that there will be a singularity, a branch point singularity, which is located uh, the chemical potential defined by this equality over here. Um, and this singularity will lie on the real uh, chemical potential axis. Okay, there is another set, uh, uh, singularity, uh, which uh, is uh, always present whenever we have fermions in the, uh, in the game. Uh, and uh, this was uh, mentioned before in Jan Steinheimer talk, uh, this is the thermal singularity. If we consider the Fermi-Dirac distribution function, uh, it has just trivial singularity or trivial uh, zeros uh, when imaginary part of the chemical potential divided by temperature is plus minus pi. Okay, and this singularity is a complex series of chemical potential in general. Okay, and there is a non-trivial example which is interesting for me. If I consider a non-zero quark mass, so I'm extending uh, this color limit. Uh, discussion uh, to a non-zero quark mass. Uh, in this case, we have a crossover, but what happens with the singularity at which was previously at the real axis of the chemical potential, it doesn't disappear. What happens to the singularity, it goes into the complex plane, and now it will sit somewhere in the complex plane at non-zero quark mass, for non-zero quark mass. Non, uh, and this is complex plane of the chemical potential at a given temperature above, you know, possible critical endpoint. Okay, and so what happens with this singularity if we lower the temperature? So if we go towards the critical uh, endpoint, this singularity, oh, one second, this singularity evolves in this complex chemical potential plane. So it moves, it uh, uh, goes closer and closer to the real axis uh, and the chemical potential, and eventually it is it pinches the real axis, and this is where we expect the critical endpoint. So the singularity, which is related to the crossover, is continuously connected to the critical endpoint. And this is the key uh, one, uh, property of the singularity. And this is why it is interesting to study uh, the location of the singularity in general, okay? So what do we know about the singularity? Well, uh, we know that how, how pressure behaves near the singularity uh, as a function of the chemical potential. And we know the, uh, uh, the, uh, the critical exponent. All right, so just to uh, demonstrate, in, of course, uh, in the model calculations, we can define the radius of convergence exactly without performing the Taylor series analysis. We can just locate the critical location of the critical point. So, and here I would like to show you a few just trivial examples computed in the um, uh, quark meser on NGL model. Uh, they are very much similar. In the curl limit, uh, I'm showing this uh, the radius of convergence, or just the chemical potential. Um, as a function of temperature. And uh, this is where the singularity is located. We know that uh, the singularity is at the real axis um, for temperatures below uh, the uh, temperature of the second order space transition here. Uh, and it is at purely imaginary uh, chemical potentials above uh, the phase transition. Okay, so this is well, very well known. Now, if we include the uh, non-zero quark mass, of course, uh, we have a crossover and the singularity is in the complex plane. Uh, but nevertheless, the radius of convergence is related to the location of the singularity one to one. And it is shown over here how this radius of convergence uh, depends on the temperature. And as again, I would like to point out, it is smoothly connected to the critical endpoint. All right. So this is just an example in the mean field model. Uh, of course, nature is much more complicated. Um, and uh, in for UQCD, we can define just the real, uh, just the location of the singularity by direct calculations. What we have to do, we have to extract the uh, Taylor series coefficient. And with this uh, first uh, few uh, Taylor series coefficients, one can estimate uh, the uh, 
radius of convergence, and essentially would be uh, uh, located somewhere along this edge of this yellow uh, region. Okay, just assuming that a few set uh, series coefficients are enough to estimate the radius of convergence. Um, or reversing this argument, uh, one can also say that the Taylor series expansion is reliable within this uh, yellow region because if this if the if the uh, uh, rates of convergence is uh, is somewhere uh, at the edge of this uh, uh, of this region, then uh, one should not uh, probably use the Taylor series expansion beyond this point. Okay. <clears throat> Of course, to really extract the uh, uh, radius of convergence uh, with uh, Taylor series expansion, one has to do a really good job. At least um, uh, if we consider a model calculation, it doesn't necessarily mean that we will have the same issue in QCD. But if we consider a model calculation, we know where the radius of convergence is located here in the current limit. Uh, but if I would just take 30 Taylor series coefficient, I mean, I'll try to extract the radius of convergence and gives me this point. Okay, which is far enough, you know, you know, for from this uh, blue line. Okay, so this even thirty uh, Taylor series coefficients are not sufficient to describe the actual uh, convergence radius in the model. I do not say that we will have the same issue in QCT, but it's it might suggest that we can have the same issue. Okay, so but is there a, another alternative way uh, to extract the radius of convergence in QCT and? Uh, and this way should be based on still first principle QCD calculations and shouldn't rely on the Taylor series expansion. Again, I think that the previous plot demonstrated to you that you potentially have to have many uh, Taylor series uh, coefficients to extract the rates of convergence. And in this talk, well, I have to assume something. I will assume that QCD belongs to all four universality class and the current limit. Um, and uh, lattice QCD uh, is uh, consistent with this assumption. Uh, please uh, uh, look uh, at that talk. And I will also assume that QCD is in the scaling regime uh, of this universality class at the physical pi mass. And again, there is some indication that there is. Uh, if not, then uh, we can extend, uh, we can uh, limit my argument to just uh, smaller pi mass. And uh, at the physical pi mass, you can consider my discussion as just a model of the reality. Okay, and based on that, it is possible to predict that the radius of convergence, uh, if I if I take this universality argument and the universal uh, input uh, from lattice QCD calculations. Okay, so uh, the uh, near the critical point due to the absence of um, a characteristic length scale, uh, the uh, free energy is a homogeneous function of uh, temperature and uh, and you know other relevant parameters. Uh, uh, for example, the uh, external magnetic field or the quark mass uh, for QCD. <clears throat> it means that essentially I can extract, I, I can expand, I, I can express this function as a function of just one single variable, which is called the scaling variable. And it is a, a non-trivial uh, combination of temperature or say quark mass or uh, for I think model, it will be a magnetic field. So often uh, we will be talking also about the so-called magnetic equation of state where you have the order parameters divided by some combination of this magnetic field. I will talk about this a little bit later. So in, uh, re in application to the QCD in the vicinity of this phase transition, uh, say pressure as a function of temperature and chemical potential uh, can be uh, uh, represented in the following form uh, where we have the universal uh, function universal free energy as a function of the scaling variable z. Okay, and the scaling variable z, the parameters of the scaling variable z can be mapped to the temperature chemical potential and the light quark mass in the following way. And there are a few non-universal parameters, for example, z0, uh, zc is also a non-universal parameter. Uh, the curvature of the phase transition is a non-universal parameter. Uh, additionally, there might be a, a High order uh, corrections to this uh, to this expansion, uh, as discussed in the previous talk. I neglect them because, uh, at least in terms of the um, baryon uh, chemical potential, they are small. Okay, so there are a few universal parameters which enter into this uh, definition. Uh, this is uh, the critical exponent beta, uh, delta, and also I have an alpha critical specific heat critical exponent entering into this equation, and they are very well known for the O4 universality class. From the latest QCD calculations, uh, I think I'm 
got them from this paper. Um, we know uh, the uh, Carl uh, phase transition temperature with quite a good degree of precision. Uh, we know the uh, curvature of the uh, of the phase transition, and we know uh, the parameters is zero. Well, with some degree of precision. Okay, and then we'll use that uh, to actually uh, this use no this non universal parameters to map. I, what I know about this function, about this uh, universal function, to QCD. Okay, so I also want to sh uh, to show you this plot by saying that uh, if we would extract this um, magnetic equation of state uh, from the lattice and compare it uh, to the universal in this case O2, uh, because the calculations were done by first stack uh, fermions, there is a non-trivial. Uh, uh, so the, this, the calculations on the lattice are consistent with universal uh, scaling function. Okay, so and uh, so this is universal scaling function uh, for, well, this is magnetic equation of state for the um, uh, for the O4 universality class. Uh, often, uh, I would prefer not to show you the free energy uh, scaling function, but instead the uh, magnetic equation of state, which is just a trivial combination uh, given over here. So the entire domain of this uh, of this function, okay. Uh, so there are a few calculations here. Let me explain them in a second. The entire domain of this function is universal, okay. So what I'm showing here, I'm showing here uh, calculations done in the function normalization group approach. Uh, these are shown by the black dots. Uh, there is a latest parameterization obtained uh, uh, in this paper, uh, which is shown by the uh, blue line, and there is also a few analytical calculations, mean field and Lagen. Uh, which are shown by the orange and uh, purple. Uh, and there is also uh, an asymptotics uh, uh, based on essentially on epsilon uh, expansion analysis. Okay, so uh, I mentioned mean field and Lagen, so let me explain what they are. Let me just explain mean field approximation uh, in a little bit more details. We can just start from the Ladao functional given by this uh, equation over here. Uh, introduce the equations of motion uh, by taking the derivative with respect to the other parameter. And from that, uh, by doing uh, a trivial rescaling, which uh, is designed uh, to introduce uh, the variables we discussed before, um, the scaling variable variable, and uh, the uh, to express the, uh, the other parameter in terms of the magnetic equation of state, the function G, uh, we will get this equation over here. And this equation, one can immediately recognize that it, it is, has singularities uh, at this point, okay? Or, you know, the magnitude of the singularity is 1.89, okay? And this singularity is interesting and we'll discuss it in a second why. For large N, well, calculations are a little bit difficult, more and more complicated, but at the end of the day, you essentially will uh, end up uh, with this equation. And this equation again has singularities. You can find them analytically. Uh, they're given over here. And this is the numerical point for the absolute value. So uh, by the way, so these functions are just plotted over here. So this is mean field and large n. And although there are singularities in the complex plane, uh, these uh, functions are pretty smooth over here. Okay, so, but if you go to the complex plane, as I said, you'll see that there are singular points over here, located over here. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, those singularities are very well known uh, from 78 and they are known as the young VH singularities. So uh, what is uh, known about the location in general beyond mean field or large N approximation? Well, not much actually. So what is uh, actually known that, uh, or was known that they're located on these uh, lines and the angle of these lines is known uh, it is, uh, it is defined by the underlying universality class. So the argument of this location is pretty well known. Uh, and this is essentially a consequence of uh, uh, Li Yang uh, theorem. It is also known how this, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the critical exponent at this point, okay, it can be computed. And it is of order of 0.1. It is interesting that this critical exponent is independent of the underlying uh, symmetry class. So it, uh, if we consider ON uh, universality class, it is independent of N, or if uh, with just one single exception, when N goes to infinity, uh, sigma is somehow non-analytic, it becomes one half. 
And the same you see in the mutual approximation action. Okay, so uh, feel theoretically near this point, uh, it can be described by pi cubic theory with imaginary coupling. And this imaginary coupling uh, actually what makes this a second order phase transition at the first instead of the first order phase transition. Uh, it has an upper critical dimension because it's pi cubic, it is six uh, compared to four for a usual O n critical point. And this is one of the reasons why the conventional absolute expansion around four dimension fails uh, near this young Lee A singularity. And this is why it doesn't, the conventional uh, expansion cannot provide you input on its location. There will be a, and it is shown why it is manifest and manifested in the presence of non perturbative term in this expansion. Okay, lattice simulations. Well, not QCD lattice simulations, but simulations of say Heisenberg uh, ferromagnet uh, cannot be performed at imaginary H or complex T because of the sign problem. And again, this is why they cannot provide input on the location of this singularity. Okay, so the location of this singularity, uh, and this is why the location of the singularity wasn't known until recently. Our choice uh, here to extract the singularity is functional normalization group approach. And I refer to Jan Pawlowski's excellent talk on the introduction to FRG. So, so I will skip this technical detail, details. I will just tell you that I will use functional normalization group approach. I will consider it the a theory which shares uh, the same universality class. Oh, well, it should be ON, uh, field theory in our case. I will extract uh, the exponents in this theory, critical exponents, just to cross check that you know, they coincide with known uh, critical uh, results for ON, that this would be a check on my uh, numerical approach. I will find non-universal parameters. Well, I start some with some uh, theory. I have to, I have to also define non-universal parameters and map them uh, to the universal scaling functions. <clears throat> okay, and then uh, I will extract a universal magnetic equation of state for real values of the of its scaling variable. And by introducing an imaginary part to uh, temperature or to symmetry breaking field, uh, this will be our choice, or this was our choice. I will extend uh, the uh, the magnetic equation of state to a full complex plane uh, in Z. Okay, and in this case, I will be able to define uh, the location of the singularity. And there are a few non-trivial checks uh, if this location is extracted uh, precisely. The first check is that. Uh, it has to lie or uh, it has to has this uh, argument which is defined by the underlying uh, universality class critical exponents and indeed we check that it is. Uh, there is also an untrivial check <coughs> that uh, this allocation as a function of uh, n approaches the large n limit which is analytical we know the result and I will show this on the next slide. We can also check that if we vary number of dimensions uh, this uh, location has to approach its mean field value when uh, the number of dimensions goes to four. This is mean field uh, limit. I will also show it on the next slide. And then general numbers for three dimensions, the universal location for the O4 is given by this number and it does vary as a function of n. So this is for O2 and this is for Z2. Okay, and this is uh, the collection of all these results on this one plot uh, as a function of n. Uh, starting from one to etc., uh, to large all the way to the large n limit, and you see that uh, these uh, lines reproduce the large n limit when you go to n equals. Well, I think it is plus five hundred over here. Okay, now we can also look at the location as a function of number of dimensions, and this is also a non-trivial check. So this is, for example, for uh, for Z two universality class. Uh, we see uh, that this location is in the function of the number of dimensions approaches it, its mean field value over here. So the mean field value shown by this line, the same for O2, O2, O4, and well, we consider the large n uh, limit in this scale of O100. O so this is shown by these lines. So there is an analytical equation how it depends on dimension in large n. This is shown by the line and look how good the description is of this curve. Uh, there is also uh, these dashed lines here is what we use to feed those non-perturbative term appearing in the epsilon expansion uh, to, uh, to extract those non-perturbative term. And, uh, see, uh, and here we demonstrate how uh, the epsilon expansion essentially with this non-perturbative term behaves. Okay. About, about one minute uh, to wrap up, uh, please. Okay. 
So having found this DC, uh, I can use the universal parameters from LQCD and find the radius of convergence. Okay, so I found this DC where, where it is located. I can use this mapping to just map it to the physical temperature and the chemical potentials. Very simple equation to solve. Z equals to ZC. Okay, and this is what is done. So uh, this is uh, now the radius of convergence as a function of temperature and chemical potential uh, for uh, different uh, masses of pine or quarks. Um, okay, so this is for the physical uh, quark, and this is uh, when I would reduce the quark mass to smaller and smaller radius, and this is the corollary. Or, and so here I will demonstrate a little bit more uh, detail. So I would like also to vary a little bit, to vary a little bit the value of ZC to show you this uncertainty, although the ZC was defined with very good precision for all four universality class in three dimensions. So the, gr the greatest uncertainty is coming from the non-universal parameter Z0. Uh, I varied this from one to two, and it is shown here by this blue band. And this essentially shows you the uh, depends of the radius of convergence uh, on the fun as a function of temperature. Okay, so if I would uh, show this in comparison to uh, the uh, known lattice QCD constraint, so it is not really consistent with that. So on this scale, and um, <clears throat> additionally, it is consistent to the functional normalization group preliminary results, which is shown by Jan Pavlovsky talk. So I think that his uh, numbers was about 107 and 635. So the critical point he was discussing is located somewhere over here. And that is non-trivially, uh, as I said, this uh, has to be smoothly connected uh, to this band, okay? Because of the radius of convergence will eventually hit the critical end point. Okay, so this is my conclusion. So the location of the young age singularity is universal but was not known for O or N. And this is actually very interesting uh, that this is probably the most obvious uh, universal number. It's not a critical exponent. It's not an amplitude. It's just over there. And it was not known. So in this talk, we uh, uh, essentially found the location of the singularity using the functional normalization group approach. Uh, we showed that it is not really consistent in different uh, regimes that we reproduce the mean field level when we vary number of dimensions, we introduce the large n limit when we vary number of uh, components. So uh, using this input uh, on universal properties and non-universal parameters from lattice QCD, we were able to extract the radius of convergence. Well, we have to assume that uh, QCD is an all-four scaling regime uh, to do that. If you do not believe so, if uh, you think that uh, this is overstretched, you can consider this as a model um, uh, for, for the real world. Implication, there is some implications of location of the critical point because of the radius of convergence is continuously connected to the critical endpoint. So one can uh, assume that whenever the critical point is, it would be continuation of the uh, orange band I showed you before. So additionally, one can uh, use this input to improve our parameterization of critical equation of state near a critical endpoint, because as I said, the epsilon expansion uh, can provide the location of the singularity, but our non-trivial, but our fits of the non-perturbative parameters in the epsilon expansion, you can now use uh, to put into the parameterization of the equation of state to improve uh, our understanding also about the behavior, behavior near Z2 critical endpoint. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh... Thank you. And any questions? Uh, Nugza? The last slides you showed a nice expression of potential in mean field approximation. There was fourth order polynomial. Nearly, I am. Well, nearly, uh, maybe earlier, just earlier. What are the polynomial with two parameters? External field, H small, and this one, this one. Uh, this is uh, potential and has uh, either three critical point or one, because derivative is cubic polynomial and there are either three real uh, 
roots or one real roots. So when you change parameters smoothly, uh, in one region, you have one critical point, another region, you have three critical points. This is nice example for uh, teaching of catastrophe theory or universality of uh, catastrophes. Uh, you know, uh, this uh, scaling and uh, usual renormalization group singularities approach, this is universal, but even more universal is the singularity theory and it's part of catastrophe theory. So this is good example to show catastrophe uh, when changing external parameters smoothly, systems change their state drastically. So have phase transition. And this property is universal. When you have uh, external parameters, which you can change smoothly. Okay, I, can I just ask, uh, I didn't hear a question yet. And in few of yeah, the time- I will take it as a comment. And take it as a comment, exactly. Comment. I, I propose that we go to the last talk and then we have an all hour to ask more questions. Um, we have a short break then and then the, the discussion session. So let's uh, thank uh, Vladimir and